of the it's ten commandments. It's our right and our duty to abolish it. Yeah, yeah. When a long train of abuses pursues and invariably evinces a design to reduce a people under absolute despotism, it is the right of the people to alter or change it and provide new guards for their future security and happiness. That's ten right. Point we platform. have that right. Exactly. So that's them. where the ten point program from. <laughs> Next thing you know, we're out in the streets patrolling police. We trained everybody. We knew what they was doing. I was ex-military. I trained even Huey Newton how to operate weapons. Because, you know, I mean, I, me and big man Albert Howard did this stuff. So my point is, okay, just to make a long story short, we out one night two months later after we didn't train everybody. And we lined up that night in West, in West, in West Oakland in the red light district. And the police has already stopped somebody. But he's out in the street somewhat and his rest is standing. Anyway... As we walk up and line up, it's 14 of us, one sister with the long earrings and the beret, etc. The cop hadn't even looked up because he's sitting in his passenger seat. His arrestee is standing back there with his hand on the trunk. And some people on the sidewalk are saying, man, who are these people? And somebody else, it was dark. He says, what are those? Is them sticks they got in their hands? Said, man, there ain't no sticks, them guns. God said, I'm getting out of here. Hewitt says, no. He would turn around. No one leave. We've already researched the law just like us. We're the new organization. We're here to observe. The he was pointing at the police, but he's talking to the people. Like, And then the cop gets out of the car. You have no right to observe me. And Hewitt says, no. Such and such a California State Supreme Court ruling states that every citizen has a right to stand and observe a police officer carrying out their duty as long as they stand a reasonable distance away. A reasonable distance in that particular ruling was constituted as 8 to 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 20 feet from you, and I'll observe you whether you like it or not. And the audience and the people said, whoa. And some sisters said, well, go ahead on and tell it, brother. And the cop says, is that gun loaded? He said, if I know it's loaded, it's good enough. What I have right here say you have no right whatsoever. He would dissipate it off on some U.S. Supreme Court ruling, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, this is my private property. You cannot remove my private property from me without due process of law. Step back. You cannot touch my weapon. And some brother standing up there, he said, man. What kind of Negroes is these? <laughs> and that was called capturing the imagination of the people with a very disciplined law, legal. It's taking civil rights and putting it on the cutting edge, really. Yes, it was. And you, you, you're not playing here. You, you, you're putting your life on the line. Right. Let, Bobby, let's fast forward before we run clean out of time to, oh, and by, I've also got to open the live line. Um, if you'd like to call and ask Bobby a question, you may call 415-621-4473. I want to fast forward to September 11th, 1971. You were invited by the prisoners who were holding hostages on the yard of Attica State Prison in a rebellion that was inspired by George Jackson's assassination just weeks earlier. And uh, you, among others, I think um, uh, Herman Badillo, uh, t uh, uh, who was a New York Congress person, um, um, William Kunstler, I believe. Yes. Um, um, Tom Wicker of the yes, New York Tom Times. Yes, Tom Wicker, yes. Uh, big Man was with you. Big, big Man, Albert Howard, Howard, and Van Taylor. Another two, two Black Panther Party members were with Taylor. me. And you were, uh, among others, I think, were invited to be observers and to uh, negotiate the prisoners' demands. You entered the prison on the evening of September 11th. Go from there. Tell well, us, when we entered happened. that prison, well, first you go in the prison. First, I was turned down. I was not allowed. Then they pointed guns and everything at the beginning of the car I was in, the rental car we was in. Uh -huh. And I'm talking about four or five shotguns and, and machine guns was pointed. And then I said, well, we got to leave. So we backed up and then we left and we left. It was on the highway back to the town of Attica. We left the prison. And then they sent a state trooper <laughs> to stop me and says, Mr. Seal, the Oswald, the warden, wants you back, et cetera. There's been a misunderstanding. So then they brought me back. Oh, under police. And then we got sword. inside, and I talked to Bill Kunstler, because Bill Kunstler had defended black, was defending Black Panther Party members anyway. I talked to Tom Wicker and others. But they apprised me. But that night, we went inside the prison into the area. Before we got there, there was a no man's land period. You know what I mean? It's like uh, five or six hundred, uh, maybe a hundred yards or more area. So there's two gates of bars here. And if you cross in there, when the behind the second one was, I mean, police 10, down, 10 or 12 down here and 10 or 12 on a, on a catwalk up there, left side and right side. 
all with machine guns, overkill, bulletproof vests, etc. And as we stopped there, the prisoners couldn't see these guards because they were to the right and side. We were being jeered, talking about we're going to get ours, you know. Mm. I'll blow the nigga past his head off, seeing some of the guards and so on. Mm -hmm. so finally, they let us in, and I went in with all, many of the negotiators, you know, who had been invited there, and uh, got in, and, uh, and, one, and they had 26, 27, 28 points. And then one of the points was they wanted a... a we had a United Airlines... We had an African-American who was a United Airlines pilot, and it had been known publicly and he worked with us he's the editor of our newspaper when he wasn't flying planes mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted me to know on the side these is a couple of the guards on the sides could we get a helicopter in and I says I don't know brother I says I, I, I can't even say that that's even possible I would have to even go back to Oakland California to talk so that and then making a few words to the prisoners power to the prisoners etc and and then I left, and then I decided what I'd do is fly all the way back to Oakland. So that night I got on a plane and flew all the way back to Oakland. Charles Gary was waiting there and went up to Huey's apartment, and there we were. And I said, they want me to arrange to get a helicopter in there. I said, and to fly over, and the prisoners who wanted to be able to hop on the helicopter and leave and go ahead, and then they would go back. <laughs> it was impossible. No, it and then so we turned right back around. That meeting was very short. And I took off back Sunday night on an overnight red eye. Yeah, because this siege lasted from yeah, the 9th through the 13th. I know, and I flew back with Charles Gary, the, my lawyer. Right. And there we were on the highway that next morning, what, just before the... And we were halfway to the prison. And that's when, live on the radio, the massacre and the attack on the prison in the prison yard occurred. Yes, that Monday morning, and and talk a little bit about what happened. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, um, I'd like to say that Tom Wicker uh, wrote a book titled "A Time to Die," mm -hmm. and the title came from Herman Badillo's basically saying, "There's always a time to die." Yes, why the rush? Right. And uh, but Rockefeller wouldn't hear it, and he um, ordered the uh, National Guard and and all kinds of uh, military police and troopers and whatever. Uh, to um, assault the the y prison yard w using helicopters, all kinds of high-powered weapons. People were running and being shot as and, they ran. And to show you the, cons the conspiracy relationship to it, the very next morning in the New York Times newspaper, it was printed that Bobby Seale had told the prison.